But since then, British politics has been kind of... I'm not going to lie. They deserve every bit of fucking uh, frustration that they experience here. Okay? You do. You fucking... You sit there and you kiss the, the hands and feet of the British. They're going to fuck you. Okay, they're going to fuck themselves, which they did, and they're going to fuck you too, and it's... ...feet high. On one side, a Catholic population. On the other, a Protestant one. Boo. But this wall isn't just here because of religious differences. Boo. It's here because people on this side of it want Northern Ireland to remain part of the UK. And people on this side want it to be part of a united island. It's called a peace wall, and there are many like it, carving Belfast up, separating neighbourhoods that were once at war with each other. Because from 1968 to 1998, this was home to some of the most dangerous armed paramilitaries in the world. Meanwhile, in Northern Ireland itself, the bombings were setting new records in horror and an IRA explosives expert received a life sentence for murder. One you might have heard of, the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, which spent 30 years fighting for a united Ireland. The conflict was called the Troubles, and would see over 3,700 people. Lord Louis Mountbatten, captain of HMS Kelly, admiral of the fleet, viceroy of India, Hero of Burma, murdered by the IRA, 15 soldiers massacred. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hero of Burma. A little, it was a little spicy, dude. A little, a little spicy. Or killed and almost Viceroy of India. <laughs> we spoke to two men who fought on opposing sides. Michael, who joined the IRA in the 70s, and Billy, who joined the Ulster Volunteer Force, or UVF, to fight. Yeah, there you go, dude. It's just like... One guy is objectively in the right here, okay? ...against the IRA. I'm Michael Colbert. I was in prison for almost 16 years. Uh, I was a life sentence prisoner. I was charged with various um, IRA-related activities, including killing members of the British forces. My name is Billy. By the way, I just, all you need to do is look at the, what is it, the Ulster, the Sons of Ulster wall. Uh, there's a, there's, oh, here it is. Here, there you go. Here, 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 here. If you want to understand what... <laughs> If you want to understand something about uh, the the uh, the Northern Irish uh, perspective, okay, understand that they have historically always ridden for the wrong side of every conflict. I mean, here, 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 here. There's more. There's more here. This is a little bit clearer. The Ulster Dixie, not Irish, but I live in Ireland. Unionists in the North are some of the biggest reactionaries, nutjobs, anti-immigration, Brexit on Twitter. Oh! Fucking exploded that thing, dude. Fuck! Woo! Let's go. Hey, Hodgson. I'm a former loyalist prisoner. I was in prison from 1974 to 1990. Um, I was in for murder. But before we get into that, you need to know about two groups that populate Northern Ireland. Irish nationalists, or Republicans, are those who want the unification of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. They tend to be Catholics. British Unionists, or Loyalists, want Northern Ireland to remain part of the UK, and they tend to be Protestants. <laughs> So what's behind this divide? How does it link to religion? And why is Northern Ireland part of the UK? <laughs> to find that out, we'll need to cover a bit of history. Um, yes, people of Catholic faith, yeah. And they'd True. formed their own army. This was the birth of the original IRA. So when Britain tried to step in, they fought the UK, but- Bro, they can't let it go. 
You know what I mean? They're just like they they will never <laughs> they never want to pull out. They just they're just like, come on, come on, let's just keep it a little bit. Come on, please. Create two Irish governments, one unionist one in the north and an Irish nationalist one in the south. But this division was rejected by most Irish citizens, and as it is today. But that left a region that was still home to a lot of Catholic Irish nationalists inside the UK, living alongside Protestant British Unionists. And so, the problems were far from solved. If no concept of the awfulness of what Ireland went through. I mean, we had this thing called the plantation and the settlers in Ireland and the planters in Ireland. That's code talk for theft, for affection of people from their homes. How do people live? They starve to death. So, I mean, we were subject to quite horrendous treatment by the big island. I think ruling one country should be enough for any country. The British government has set up a false state here in the north of Ireland. So I don't use the term the UK, because the UK would mean legitimizing the existence of the northern state. If I was talking about the Big Island, I would talk about Britain, because I, I, I see this part of Ireland as being Ireland. But the actual use of the word in the UK acknowledges the existence of this state. If you go to Belfast, state propaganda is intense, billboards and pictures, ISIS equals IRA. Wait, really? Still? And to a degree to a Republican. That's what the conflict was about. By the way, do not think for one minute that people like me are wanting the north of Ireland to join with the south of Ireland. We're wanting you, Ireland. Because we see the southern state has been quite corrupt. Do I want to get into a state where you have the same two ruling parties that is ruled corruptly? under the auspices of the Catholic Church for a hundred years? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's not what I spent 16 years in prison for or was engaged in military activity about. Oh no. We want a new start for the people on the island of Ireland. We're politically and culturally British. You know, I've lived here all my life. We can talk about 600 years, we can talk about 300 years, but this is 100 years. Like, if there was United Ireland here, People here would be persecuted. People would be murdered. So if you think it's bad in Iraq or Iran, it'll be a thousand times worse here. <laughs> what? Yo. Yo. He said it's a thousand times worse here than Iraq or Iran? Bro. One million by the most conservative estimation. What the fuck? That's crazy. I like that. He said it's worse. He said the IRA is worse than ISIS. <laughs> uh, one billion, one billion Northern Irish, well, uh, British, dead in Northern Ireland. They may not throw LGBT people off the roof, but they'll certainly shoot and kill and persecute lawyers. And Republicans would be behind that. How did you actually come to be involved in the IRA in the, in the first place? Look, I was a young man in the 1960s. England was getting thrown out of their colonies all over the world. Our struggle was an anti-colonial struggle. So the tactics which they used in Africa or the Middle East, India, it's no different. To understand why someone would join a group like the IRA or UVF and be willing to commit acts of violence in their name, you have to know a bit about Northern Ireland in the 1960s and 70s. Discrimination against Irish Catholics was rampant. Most large businesses were run by Protestant Unionists, who gave preference to Protestant employees or simply refused to hire Catholics. The courts and police forces were overwhelmingly Protestant and treated Protestants more favorably, and then there was the housing, but this was more than just a place to live. You only had the right to vote in local elections here if you or your spouse owned property. <laughs> he said he's right, at least we have sunlight and great weather in Iraq. <laughs> Not only were the wealthier Protestants more likely to own property than Catholics, but council homes were often allocated by Protestant local councillors to Protestant families who would then vote to keep them in power. Allocation of a vote depended on you having a house. 
and having a house dependent on who got elected because the council's allocated housing. There, there's a circle here and you had to break the circle. So what we were pushing for was the one person, one vote. You had some people, if they were big property owners, they could own 10 houses, the 10 votes. Whereas you could have two families living in the house with a couple of adults in each family and there was no vote. Even though the civil war had ended decades ago, the IRA hadn't actually gone. And against the backdrop of a growing civil rights movement, it was recruiting again. So the British government, to try and weaken the IRA, introduced a new law, giving them the ability to imprison people without trial. That <laughs> process was called internment. There are now something like... Another thing that the British love, internment camps. Um... Uh, Partitioning and internments is a, is a classic angloid attitude. It's just like these are things in the angloid arsenal. They 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 deploy it so willingly. Twelve thousand people held in camps like this throughout Northern Ireland since the British government began its controversial policy of internment three months ago. The internment controversial. Chat, chat, this is, let me explain something to you, okay? We are now 20 plus years out from World War II, okay? Almost 30 years out from World War II. Television exists at this point. Many of your mothers and fathers are... Uh, alive at this point. Like they are watching this happen on their TVs. And the television man is saying the internment policy is controversial. I feel like just simply st saying that it's controversial is undermining it a little bit. You know what I mean? Just something to consider. When you look at the media, even back then, was brought in in August 1971. I mean, what do you say about a government which has to bring in a term? And there's something wrong somewhere. Because the vast majority of the people they interned were people who they perceived as being anti-state, but they were wrong. I gotta pee. Or they were anti-state, but not violently anti-state. As the tension simmered, there were two camps. So what they had was a totally reform movement for electoral changes with the civil rights movement, and yet they always the little Bernie bit, which was revolution. There is a history of rebellion against the British rule. It's always there, and nearly every about 20, 30 years, there's an attempted revolt. The IRA had tried to lift their military campaign in the late 1960s. It wasn't overly working. While the IRA was trying to make a comeback, initially, most people supported the peaceful reformists. But then came a protest on the 30th of January, 1972. On the last Sunday in January, Catholic civil rights marches defied a government ban on parades and came into violent conflict with British troops in the center of Londonderry. 15,000 Irish people defied a ban on public gatherings and marched against the internment law. Soldiers made arrests, used tear gas and rubber bullets, while protesters threw stones. And at 4.10 p.m., British soldiers began firing live rounds at the crowd on what would come to be known as Bloody Sunday. 1972, the civil rights march in Derry, which I'm sure you've heard of, Bloody Sunday, where 13 people were shot dead. Reform, reform had to be put in the bin, had to be put to the side, and to a degree, revolution took over. And I would have been one of the thousands of young men then, and women who decided, nah, I'm not gonna take any more of this. And so I ask our people at this difficult and trying time to remain calm. Within the space of half an hour in the middle of the afternoon... Rock throwing met with gunfire. Hmm, sounds familiar. Yeah, also unjustifiable state actions that 
unjustifiable state actions met with uh, mostly civil disobedience, which then turns, uh, which then turns up when you have uh, gunfire being utilized against uh, a, a crowd of protesters. Hmm. No fewer than 20 large bombs exploded in various parts of the city. This was a tipping point. After Bloody Sunday, support for armed revolution surged. The IRA was back with a vengeance and would undertake a 30-year fight against British and Unionist forces, becoming one of the most feared and infamous paramilitaries in the world. That the British government during the 1970s, it did make an effort to bring about major reform here. But the ball was already then rolling down the hill. Right? The IRA campaign was underway. Thousands of people had joined into the IRA, so it was too late. Eventually, Belfast particularly became this gated uh, community. <laughs> My grandparents are Irish and actually lived through this. They said the worst part of internment was hourly breaks to listen to British advertisement. They still hold a gr I don't know why I'm speaking like this. What's happening, dude? It literally, it, it broke my fucking brain. As soon as I hear a guy talk <laughs> from Ireland, <laughs> immediately I start doing that British advertisement. You know, in my heart of hearts, I'm, Ar I'm Irish as well. Especially at the top of the hour when there's a three minute ad break. I was already going to do it. Chatter. You fucking bastard. I was already getting it ready. You fucking bastard. Probably the greatest fucking ad break segue of all time. At the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe. For $5. Or for free with a Twitch Prime. You fucking bastard. You can also get gifted a sub if you're lucky. Here is the free minute ad break now. Anyway, let's go. You weren't able to approach the city center except you had to go through gates and be searched because of the IRA bombings. At this stage, the forces they faced were the 8,500 strong Royal Ulster Constabulary, or RUC, which was the mostly Protestant police force in Northern Ireland, and the 21,000 British troops deployed to Northern Ireland to support the RUC under Operation Banner. That operation would last 38 years, making it the longest continuous military deployment in British history. In areas like this, there was a lot of British forces killed. It was the, the conflict was mostly uh, contained within working class nationalist stroke Republican areas. What they then had then was the growth of reactionary forces then being formulated. Uh, those reactionary forces would have been on the pro-union side who got their logic from um, attacking nationalist stroke Republican communities with this vague concept of, well, if we kill enough people in that, that area, those people will be telling Republicans to nice, stop nine, nine. forces. I made the choices in the organization, but there were reasons why I joined it. hundred yards from here, um, there was a place called the Bar Morris Showroom, uh, and it was blown up. It was an 18-month-old baby killed in it. There was a boy killed in it. I didn't know at the time of the bomb, but I knew afterwards and I knew the fella. There was a, a pub that was blown up. I called a four-step in and two pensioners who everybody in the Chandra knew because they were characters um, and everybody knew them, but the IRA blew that up. Those are the two things that were impacting me most because they were very local and I knew people. The IRA were attacking me, these communities and murdering people, planting bombs and nobody was doing anything about it. You know, British government wasn't doing anything, the police's hands were tied, and you know, you had to make a decision then. Yeah, this guy was like, this was this guy's like moment where he's like, oh, totally unprovoked, <laughs> totally, totally and utterly unprovoked. <laughs> where did it come from? Nobody knows. <laughs> I mean, what? <laughs> the British were simply doing internment. <laughs> 
uh, hundred, uh, one one thousand years of colonial violence. Totally unprovoked, though. The pub. Do you condemn the IRA? Um, I probably made a decision when I was 15 that we needed to do something about it. Uh, yeah. That's how I got involved. He said that the British and the Unionists had a right to defend themselves. <laughs> In all the fighting, there were over 10,000 bombings and almost 37,000 shootings. Over 3,700 people were The more I learn about conflicts around the world, the more I come into the conclusion that the British Empire is the root of all evil in the modern world. And, and a continuation of that is the American Empire. So yes, you're right. ...were killed and almost 50,000 injured. In Britain, the conflict came to be called the Troubles. But some of those who were involved in it push back on that name. The Troubles is such a, it's a weak term. Uh, we call it the conflict, right? Which is a, a softies term. Others, friends of mine, will call it the war. Uh, because it was a girl of war. A uh, girl of war in the streets, in the countryside. In England, we were also active. In oh, dude, remember when I went here? I went here. I saw it. I just don't know how you can be so cucked as to be uh, a, a Northern Irish uh, a British Unionist. Because it's like, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, I was doing a, 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 a uh, uh, IRL stream with Jack Manifold, and we went there. This is, where, this is where the IRA almost assassinated British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, which is unfortunate that they missed, but... That was the that was the only problem with the IRA is that they missed. So close. Like this guy? Who? IRA Pepe Spit. Northern Ireland is still a part of Britain, too based. Not everything is police fault. Nuke unlock soon. Pepe spit, Putin bot, turfs, Pepe spit, just say no. <sighs> average labor voter in 2023. I don't know if this guy is an average labor voter. Bricks, I think this guy is just like a regular old neoliberal who still also likes me as well, but uh, not too much. Two states, Taiwan and China, Bricks countries, I can't. He thinks it's an RPG. Copium, surely they would hold elections. Not as good as a one state solution, but at least this chance is a chance working, so we have to support it. Yeah, he's like. Anyway, let's get to it. We're active in uh, Europe. It was actually a British military mom who shot dead in Australia by the IRA. So, I mean, we consider it a war. This troubles gives it a, an inference of being a, an internal sort of civilian throwing stones at each other. So, you know, if you'd have seen this area back, you would not believe with armored cars and. The military personnel on it just wouldn't believe it. Do you regret involvement with the violence? No, not the slightest. No. I've been asked that quite a few times by especially the Americans. And I go, to them, <laughs> what would you have done in the nineteen eighties if the Russians had landed? Uh, do I regret? Absolutely not. I think I've been very instrumental in bringing about major societal change. We considered it a war, a anti colonial war. So, no, no regrets. I regret being in prison. I regret the loss of life. I regret the hurt. All that type of stuff. And it's been hundreds of years, but white people in my country, New Zealand, still identify with Scotland and hate the English because of it. Bro, you should <laughs> wait. <laughs> they hate. They identify with Scotland and hate the English because of it. But like, if you ask the Scottish, I mean, <laughs> some also hate the English. But there's plenty of Scots that were uh, that were willing dogs to the English as well. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like it's not as it's not as clear cut. I I would say as as the Irish and their understandable uh, hatred for the English. A lot of Scottish people hate the English, obviously. Um, however. 
you know, there's still there's still a decent there's still a decent amount. Kiwis are far from the Irish. Scottish people make up a disproportionate part of the UK security forces. Not and then seeing Mamie Agnell, whatever killer or whatever it is, we were sentenced under terrorism legislation. I didn't consider myself a terrorist. It might sound a bit, I don't know, cheeky of me to say to you, but what would your views be to the French who resisted the German occupation? What would mine be? Yeah. They would, I mean, I would obviously say, yeah, that it's, uh, you'd be fighting an occupying So force. would you then say to the French, in 1946, do you regret killing those Germans? I mean, that's, I'm, I'm so aggressive by me to say it, but that's the way I feel. No, absolutely justified. Why should I have a foreign soldier in my country? If you think other oh, people aren't paid to get rid of them, what, what, what's your, your, your nationality again? Uh, well, I'm English. Yeah, you're, you're English. Yeah. I mean, you know, you didn't I'm a Brit and I traveled all around Ireland, going around the country on a bike, staying in hostels. The people I met in the north had such hate for the Republic of Ireland. It's not even entirely about wanting to be a part of the UK. It's just pure anger from the baggage of all these terrible events. Also, the ones who want to stay part of the UK have it all set up exactly how they want it and don't want to hand over that power slash status. <laughs> it's just anti-Irish resentment. <laughs> Let the Germans come over. Oh, Churchill held them back on the beaches. To me, it's a, it's a no-brainer. But I understand you asking the questions. My regrets are that life had to be taken. Because I'm a father, grandfather, husband, brother. I'm just, I'm an okay fella. I just was a member of the IRA. This guy is so chill. Uh, I, I don't regret it, no. I don't regret being involved in the violence, but I regret every life it was taken and my option I took, and I don't regret it. And, uh, you know, I won't deny it ever, you know, as far as I'm concerned. I had this guy, it. not chill. And, but I don't make excuses about it. I try to try to find reasons. But what I don't want to do is to condemn another generation of young people in this society to any type of war. I don't think the circumstances are the circumstances that I was growing up in. And I think that people need to allow us to try to find a political solution. The first of those political solutions and the transition from violence to politics came on the 10th of April, 1998, in the form of the Good Friday Agreement. After two years... My family immigrated to the US to work and send money back home to Ireland to help start the new government, became gun runners in Colorado. That sounds fucking sick. It a lot of people outside of Northern Ireland seem to think that this solved the issue entirely. But what it really did was secure peace for now and leave the question of Northern Ireland's place in the UK open-ended. It stated that Northern Ireland... Aren't also a lot of Northern Irish, at least partially English ancestry, surely that has nothing to do with it? I mean... Don't get me started on this shit, okay? It's all the same. Ridiculous. ...and would remain part of the UK until a majority of people in both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland wanted unification. If unification ever does have majority support, it says there should be a referendum. It wasn't the United Ireland that Republicans wanted, and it wasn't a guarantee that Northern Ireland would be part of the UK forever. But the majority of people were okay with this middle ground if it meant the violence would stop. This political solution was much easier when the UK was in the EU. The land borders were invisible, and that meant things were flexible. People could act as though there was or wasn't a border, depending on their identity. But then... <laughs> I remember this. When the UK voted to leave the EU in 2016, it changed everything. Because this is the UK's only land border with an EU country. And Brexit risked creating a hard border here, with customs checks and security posts. I remember Anywhere covering else, this exact that detail of Brexit. Acceptable. But here, it threatens the agreement that put an end to three decades of bloodshed because it puts a barrier between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Something thousands of Irish Republicans fought against. So to try and get around that, 
Initially, the UK and EU agreed on the Northern Ireland Protocol, which moved this border, basically creating a customs barrier in the sea between Northern Ireland and Britain, and leaving Northern Ireland inside the EU single market. For loyalists, though, this threatened their place in the UK, and was likely to draw Northern Ireland and the Republic closer together while distancing it from Britain. From the Unionist Loyalist perspective, they see their connection with Britain definitely, definitely winning. The, 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 their protests about the Brexit, they want the Brexit. <laughs> That's the best part! Oh. While the majority of Unionists supported Brexit, Billy Hutchinson they did not. They supported this very English nationalist perspective to leave Europe, which I think is very, very dangerous. So we've got the protocols now. You know, the people call an Irish sea border. I believe that it, it abuses my rights. We need unfettered access between here and the rest of the United Kingdom. There, you know, the border is a killing. He's probably went through it. You know, it's been there for a hundred years. The Irish government and all of the nationalist and Republican parties all said if there's a border there, that uh, there would be Republican attacks on it. So they moved it. We can't live under threat from Republicans. But since then, British politics has been kind of... I'm not going to lie, they deserve every bit of fucking uh, frustration that they experience here, okay? You do. You fucking, you sit there and you kiss the, the hands and feet of the British. They're going to fuck you. Okay, they're going to fuck themselves, which they did, and they're going to fuck you too, and it's your fault. Chaotic. Boris Johnson is going to step down. My f no one is remotely indispensable. I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. Liz Truss has been elected leader <laughs> of Britain's Conservative Party. God, England has been taking so many unimaginable L's, dude. Like... Just fucking a sequence of L after L after L. Wow. It will become the UK's next prime minister. For the second time this year, our prime minister has resigned. I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected. I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. Rishi Sunak is set to become prime minister of the United Kingdom. I am humbled and honored to be elected as leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. Three prime ministers in one year obviously leads to some changes. And so, out with the Northern Ireland Protocol, in with the Windsor Framework. 27 pages, 13,000 words. Now it's a deal that Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, or even Theresa May could not strike. The new plan is to create two separate customs lanes. A green lane for goods moving between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK, and a red lane for those moving between the UK and EU. Goods in the green lane aren't subject to EU checks, which should make the Irish sea border much less noticeable, meaning unionists can breathe a sigh of relief. But it's worth keeping in mind that the Windsor framework hasn't actually been implemented yet, and how well it'll actually work in practice is an open question. So while peace has been achieved and bullets are no longer whizzing overhead, the tension is still very much there and was one of the biggest sticking points in EU-UK Brexit negotiations. <sighs> On the ground though, today that tension is most visible in Northern Ireland's segregated neighborhoods, where Protestants live on one side of a peace wall and Catholics on another. Within moments of entering any of these areas, it's obvious which side of the divide the people that live there are on. In Belfast, Catholic Republican strongholds like Falls Road and Protestant Unionist ones like... We seek nothing but the elementary right implanted in every man, the right that if you're attacked to defend yourself. The Shankill are home to countless murals expressing loyalist or Republican allegiance that cover the sides of buildings and Irish or British flags dot the streets, along with memorials 
marking either IRA or British Unionist attacks. The Northern Irish government aimed to remove all peace walls here by 2023. But they've missed that target. There's still 20 miles of the structures left in Northern Ireland, mostly in Belfast. And many people have them running straight through their back gardens. What is it like having a peace line in your back garden? Dark and south there entirely, um, but I suppose we feel safe, the same thing. Well, I think everybody's glad that they're here, but I suppose it would be a wee bit better if we could get a wee bit more natural light in, you know, mm. have sort of <laughs> corrugated shields the whole way down rather than the big green things in the end. So the whole back of my house is completely dark. I'm old enough, right, to remember when there was no peace walls. But when I walked down Conway Street and I crossed the road, Right away, I knew where I was. I was in a cafe area. I mean, you don't drive through a village or a town in Northern Ireland without knowing what it is. So, from that point of view, we've always had peace walls in our heads. And when you go to a peace wall, you know, you're going, all these people in the RSA must be bad, that's why they've got that wall there. So, you've got two factions on each side, and one thinks all the, union, you know, all the prods are bad, and one thinks all the Catholics are bad. You know, it's in people's heads, and we've never got rid of it, you know. So you can't take them down until peace of people's got a peace of mind, and we don't have that. It's not quite segregated, but that's what people are used to in their living. It'd be nice, it'd be nice to have people living all in a broadly mixed society, but we have maybe several hundred years of separated living. It's customary, but that tends to be in the working class areas. You don't get major issues in middle class or upper class areas. But you're right, in working class areas, there's still major segregation. Belfast is the most starkly divided city I've ever visited. For one side, this is a fight for Irish freedom. For the other, it's the risk of being dragged into a country they don't want to be a part of. There isn't really much room for compromise beyond what's already been achieved and both sides have taken up arms for their respective causes before. But regardless of the cause, civilians were often the victims. 50 Legit question, what is the separation based on here? Uh, uh, the English settled in like, I mean, settled almost a thousand years ago, and then basically, I mean, had colonized the entire land and the areas that they settled most aggressively, they decided, uh, or, or 500, 400 years ago, sorry. Uh, and then the areas that they settled most aggressively, they, they maintained, I mean, they were Protestants, uh, Irish people are Catholic. And so they like uh, parts of Northern Ireland uh, is still a part, technically a part of England, a part of the United Kingdom. Okay. And they, f they see themselves as like, you know, spicy English. They're cucks. They're cucks to the, the royalist cucks. Fifty-four percent of those killed in the conflict and 68% of those injured were civilians. Sometimes targeted just for being Catholic. Well, also 900 plus years ago, you weren't wrong. The Norman nobility of England colonized Ireland as well. I mean, yes. Technically, it, it does go back, uh, uh, you know, uh, 1,000 years. So basically, <sighs> that's it. I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it. I feel like I've described it already, that they just, they're still desperately trying to maintain uh, a, a connection to the United Kingdom. Or Protestant. 
Republican paramilitaries killed 2,057 people, and over a third of their victims were civilians. Loyalist paramilitaries killed fewer people, 1,027, but 85% of their victims were civilians. The British Army also killed 188 civilians, mostly Catholics, and the RUC killed 28. Mm. So while it's important to listen to those mm. who were directly involved in the conflict to make sure history doesn't repeat itself, we all- Latest, latest polls show a majority for unification among young people in Northern Ireland. Why would people want to be a part of the UK? Why would we want to be a part of the UK? Young people will probably soon deliver a united Ireland. So, I've heard this, but as far as I understand, um, the- uh, like they will never they will never let this happen, right? Like I know that originally it was uh, it was going to be up to a referendum, but I mean think about it this way. Um a similar attitude exists in Scotland as well. And Scotland is is established as a, as a state comprised of Scottish people who have a national identity as Scottish people. And it, it, even then, it's... Uh, it's not... Uh, it's not able to leave. It's very different comparing Ireland to Scotland, to be honest. But here we have the sovereign Irish government that can also press for it, unlike in Scotland. True. Demographics favor eventual reunification in Northern Ireland. Catholics be breeding. It would be so funny if Star Trek was right about Ireland reunification in 2024. It's not like Scotland at all because the UK government can't block it. I know, but I feel like... I feel like the, the North Irish government will uh, do everything in its power to stop it from happening and try to pull the UK back in. Not, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Polls and surveys have consistently demonstrated the Griffith generation are more than likely to vote for a United Ireland, far more likely to identify as Irish or Northern Irish, and that the vast majority do not align themselves with unionist ideology, all of which suggests pro-union parties are likely uh, to face an uphill battle in convincing them that Northern Ireland's place is in the UK. Economically, United Ireland's a bad idea. Better to stay in the UK, to be honest. Why? All right, let's continue. Let's finish this. We also need to remember the people that suffered as a result of their actions. Michael and Billy didn't go into much detail on the specific charges they were sentenced for, but Billy's case is a little easier to find online. He was sentenced to life for his role in the murder of two civilian Catholic men, Michael Lauren and Edward Morgan, who were not involved with the paramilitaries. I didn't find much about Michael's case, but he was involved in the killings of members of the British forces, and a book called Anatomy of a Killing suggests that he gave the order to kill Miller McAllister, a police photographer for the RUC who was shot in front of his children. With so many dead and injured, the bitterness here runs deep and the trauma left in the wake of the conflict will be felt for decades to come. As things stand today, occasionally violence does flare up. There are still clashes between Protestant groups like the Orange Order and Irish Republicans and Catholics. And some splinter groups of the paramilitaries, like the Continuity IRA, are still armed. Unfortunately, there's a small core within our nationalist areas who claim to be Republican activists, but don't attack the state, but do have weaponry, and say that they're against the peace process. That's up to the police to do the job, and uh, our communities will be better off without those people. But there's an awful lot of people within loyalist areas who claim their labels as loyalist activists who are gangsters criminals, drug dealers, etc. So a lot of them have a lot of negative sway in their areas. Despite those groups, the majority of people who were actually involved in the conflict have committed to the peace process. 
and turned to dialogue. Michael now runs Kostya, an organization that provides assistance to Republican ex-prisoners, while Billy is the leader of the Progressive Unionist Party. But even so, it's difficult to know exactly what the future holds in Northern Ireland, especially now that Brexit has shaken the foundations of the Good Friday Agreement. Whatever the outcome, one side is bound to feel like they're losing. And hopefully now, you'll understand why. It was the first time the Irish Nationalist Party 